Well, thanks, Alex. So, yeah, as, uh, as he said, I'm stepping in for a talk about uh, Lacoste U. I'm going to talk about briefly about experiencing my team here at Bloomberg with a load testing tool that we used. It's written in Python, it's open source, and we used it to load test some of our backend services. Uh, I'm Ivan. This talk was delivered by Kubilay, my teammate in Fosdem last year. No, actually, this year, last edition. And I'm also working in at Bloomberg. So to provide a bit of context, I'm going to start talking about our product. This is Worksheets. It's a market data monitoring tool that have, uh, professionals from the finance industry use to monitor live data. So you can see it, some of the numbers here flashing. Uh, they actually they type in the securities that they're interested in. They can get the data. They can type formulas. They can share this with their colleagues and have like a collaborative editing environment. And this is a new product that we're developing right now, and we're releasing to clients. So so far it's going well. We're going to release it to even more clients, and we ask to ourselves: If we grow our user base, are we going to be able to handle the load? Do we have enough capacity? That's not the emoji that I was expecting. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I guess the font is different here. So we ask ourselves, can, are we going to be able to, to handle the new loads? Are we going to be able to provide the service to more clients? Or is it going to collapse catastrophically? That's not what we want to happen, right? So that's where load, load testing comes in place. First of all, what is what we want to measure here? There are uh, certain attributes or characteristics of a system that we want to assess or evaluate. I'll start explaining some of them. One is the capacity. So is the size of the infrastructure adequate for the load that we're expecting? Do we have enough machines? Do we have enough bandwidth on our network? Do we need more CPU, more memory, and so on? Is the speed of the system enough? Um, how long does it take to, for a service to respond when we send a request? How long does it take for the database to, to retrieve the data? Is that enough in our context? What does being enough even mean? That's something that we need to answer. Is our system scalable? This is uh, if we have um, our system X and we double its size, will it be able to handle double the load? That's not necessarily true, right? Sometimes um, it could be that it can handle more load, but not like precisely double, so we throw more machines or more iron, more bandwidth, whatever it is. But it doesn't necessarily mean that its system is going to be able to cope with more load. Uh, so what's the scaling factor, we would, we would ask ourselves. And another characteristic would be the stability of a system. Does the system behave correctly under load? Uh, does, it start, is, 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 uh, it, does it become flaky when the load increases? Does it become to fall apart? Something not terrible, right? So how do we answer to all of these questions? There's lots of questions. We need answers. So for that, testing comes in place. Um, there are different kinds of testing, as you all know. We have unit tests, performance tests, uh, load testing, stress testing, integration testing. Here I'm going to mention briefly these three, because of the ones like, uh, the meaning of this is not quite settled in the literature. So some authors use different terms for the same concepts. I'm going to explain what I understand for performance testing, load testing, and stress testing. You might go to all the resources and find different explanations. But pretty much for the purpose of this talk, performance testing would be a way to evaluate the performance of a system against the benchmark. So we want to get the numbers, the raw numbers, like time that we spend in doing some operation. We don't test particularly with heavy load. We just want to get the data, and we fine tune the different parts of the, of the system to, to get the, the right numbers, basically. So the, the goals of performance testing would be, as I said, establishing the benchmarks. But we don't want to really find the effects because we have the, all the types of testing for that goal. Load testing, which is the one that we're going to focus on. Uh, in this case, we want to feed the system the, a, a big task, basically increase the loads and see when it stops working. So at some point, it will. It will not be able to cope with it. And we do this by simulating virtual users. So we'll see how to do this with Locus later. This is the one we, that we're interested in. But it also overlaps a bit with performance testing and stress testing. That's why I'm explaining all three of them. So the goal here is to expose defects, probably related to memory management, things like memory leaks that become obvious as, as the load increases and determining the, the limit of, of our system, be it the database, the network, the CPU, memory, 
health mark and we go. And stress testing is slightly different. So in this case, instead of throwing more load, we take resources away. So the system, we start with the system in a, in a normal status. We take machines away, we take network bandwidth away, uh, we bring dependencies down and see what happens. In this case, the goal is to make sure that the system can, it will fail, but it can recover gracefully from those failures, or if there's uh, some level of resilience uh, to, to those failures. And we want to establish what the application should do when that happens, if the inevitable happens. So, as I said, we're going to focus on load testing. There are some points to consider before we start load testing and to establish if, if it's the right thing to do. First of all, we need to have some monitoring tools because if we will start load testing and we don't have the tools to see what's happening, then we can't get any information out of our tests. So we would have logs, metrics, things like that to, see, to, to be able to, to see the, the big picture. Uh, the risk of a service failure should be important enough, which means that there may be services that we don't want to test because they simply, we don't really care if they fail or they are critical. So we should first focus on the, on the critical parts, which seems a bit obvious, but yes, worth mentioning. And it's important to notice that we will never be 100% right when we do load testing because we can't model perfectly what the users will do with the application. So for this to become more accurate, we will need first to either identify usage patterns. So we need to know how the users use our application, what are the most common actions that they do, what are the workflows, in, in which they, they use our application, we would have to define the success criteria in measurable, measurable terms, so basically setting our goals, um, saying we want to be able to respond in less than this time, or we want to be able to handle this amount of users, we want to set our targets, so to speak. And also, very important, we need to isolate the testing environment. This seems obvious, but still, it may be dangerous. It wouldn't take uh, proactive steps to, to prevent this. So I'll say that again, isolate your testing environment. Because even if it's not obvious, um, I mean, it may not be obvious, but you could have situations where you don't expect to hit your production environment and you end up somehow uh, having an impact during your load test. So make sure you don't ruin your production environment. Um, these are some of the metrics that we used in, in our team. Uh, I'm sure you can come up with more. Throughput so response time error rate, CPU use. Um, these are the ones we were interested in. But well, basically, you can, you can have whatever you need for your system. So, low cost. This is the, as I said, it's a Python open source tool. Uh, you can specify the user behavior in code, which is pretty cool. So you can have a class specifying what a user would do, send this request, send this other request, and you can uh, basically distribute this in different machines and start sending load based on the specification that we've done in Python. We'll see an example later in Python code. It's based on coroutines and async approach, which means that it makes it scalable and it's a nice uh, coding pattern to follow. And it's, we say that it's battle tested because it's been used by all the companies extensively, like for example, they say on the web page that the, the developers of the game Battlefield use it to swarm like, their servers with players, with big players. Sorry. So there's a command line interface that we can use to run Locust. It looks like this. Um, we specify no web to use the command line. The Locust file is, is the specification of the users, of the user actions that I mentioned earlier. We're going to see an example later. Then we specify the number of users that, that we want to simulate, what's the hatch rate of, of those users, how many requests we want to send in total. There's also an option to specify uh, the time that we want to have the locals running. So we could say, uh, generate 100 users, 10 new users per second, and have that running for an hour, and we'll see what happens. There's an also a web interface that we can use to, to monitor the data. So it looks something like this, you can enter the the number of users you want to simulate, the hatch rate, and then once you start swarming, you get here like a list. I've listed here the requests that we have in our service. You would have whatever request, number of requests sent, time that it's taken, number of failures, uh, like some statistics about the, about the measurements. 
And yeah, basically he, that's, that's it. You have a big red button on top in case something goes really wrong. And this is what I mentioned earlier, the locus file. So this is how we define the user behavior. Um, we have a task set class, actually it was called, yeah. Where you specify uh, the, the task that your users will run. You use the decorator task to say that uh, a client can run the, in this case, it's, uh, it's an example for a web page. So using an HTTP client, you could get the, the root of the, of the website. You could get the about page of the website. You, could, you would expect the root of the home page to be hit quite more often than the about page. So you can specify an argument to the task decorator, make this 10 times more common than the about, uh, for example, than the about request. So you would specify task 10 and here task one, something like that. So based on the data that you gather by analyzing how your users use your application, you can simulate that in your locus file to kind of get like a realistic simulation. And then the, this is the, the locus client. So basically you, you set the, the tasks in the class that you have defined before. You set how many, the, the mean wait and max wait times, which is every user will send a request every five, between every five seconds and 15 seconds randomly and uniformly. Uh, and this is how it works, basically. There's also the possibility to use a different client. So in this case, it's pretty simple because it's a HTTP built-in locus client. You can specify your own protocol instead of HTTP if you're using RPC or whatever TCP protocol that you have. You can do your custom client where you specify all the requests, how those requests need to be processed. And here you specify the, if, when a failure happens, what's the, the information that you want to see about the failure, like the name, response time, exception, or, or the success. And basically you pass, uh, instead of using the HTTP locust, you use your custom locust here, custom locust class. It has to be a subclass of locust, and that's the way that's the way you generate, you specify your, your your user behavior. To deploy this, once everything is defined, we use containers. So we use Docker uh, because it's well suited for tasks like this. Uh, keeps things separate. It's easy to deploy. You specify all your dependencies and everything, and, and that's it. And it's distributed, so you need to spawn more machines to get more users simulated. You can just uh, spin up more, more Docker containers. This is kind of the architecture that we used in our team. So on the left-hand side, we have the, the cloud. Uh, we have a Locust master machine that is orchestrating the, 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 the swarm. So this Locust machine, we talk to slaves, and the slaves are the ones actually sending the request to our test environment. This is an alpha cluster, so we're doing the load testing on alpha but we have two machines and it's important that we do the, we send the request from outside the machines that we're testing because otherwise we're spending resources in generating in sim the simulation and thus the, 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 the results won't be accurate. So we have to do it from all the, from a different environment. Uh, in this case, we used a Redis database as a cache because for the request that we use because uh, the request that you specify need to model the, what your users actually do. So we actually uh, generate some mock data in the Redis database so that the locals, the slaves can send meaningful requests. Uh, I have a demo, so I'm gonna show a video. I'm not going to do a live demo, sorry, for no risks. We can see the locust interface here in action, or maybe not. Doesn't want to play. Okay, I can scroll myself manually, and it kind of plays. No, really. <laughs> well, it's the screen that we saw before. We can see uh, here at the top. It says how the the rate, uh, I mean the, the heart rate, uh, how the users are generated, the requests are sent. So these numbers start increasing and we can see the number of failures that we have and so on until we hit a stop and it, complete, and it halts completely. 
not here. Pretty much. So this is kind of a success story for Locust in our team. We started experimenting with this, and we saw on the first day that there were many requests that weren't being dropped unexpectedly, even with uh, relatively small loads. So those requests were taking too long, and we were blocking all the requests. We, we, we didn't really know why, so the first thing that we did was adding more instrumentation. We added more logs, we added more metrics to understand exactly what the problem lied. We found that, that it was a regression in a database access. A couple of weeks before we started using Logost, we had introduced a regression that made our database queries much slower. So we made a fix immediately, and we shifted it to production. You can see here the blue line is the dev environment. So the day that we found the issue, we fixed it, and it immediately dropped like seconds. So it was a big success. And you can see that in this later following a stage rollout, it reached beta and, and it jumped production. So this is what we did at the time. Now, as a future work, we have to plans to implement this for all the services. We're basically testing one of our services. We want to add it for more. Well, we're testing a couple, but there are still more that we want to test with different protocols even. Uh, there's also the possibility to run this on CI because so far we run it manually using either the command line or either the interface. But it will be interesting to have this running, for example, on a Jenkins instance. So periodically, maybe nightly, weekly, or whatever it is, we have to decide, run this locust instance and then compare the results to see if we're doing better or if we've introduced some, some performance issue. So yeah, that's basically everything that I had. Thanks for coming. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Awesome, thank you very much, man. I've got a first question over here. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, uh, a question, I was looking at uh, how you could define max weight if something took too long, but you could also define min weight. So how does that work? Like, is it the case that sometimes you don't want something to respond too fast? Uh, I'm just curious about that. Um, sorry, can you say it again? The, it the, in one of the slides, you could define the max weight. Yeah, and the min weight. Which I assume is like, uh, you don't want this request to take longer than that, mm -hmm. uh, but you also define the min weight. Yeah. Should I understand to be that we, you don't because want to you take don't that faster than Yeah, that. because you don't expect the users to be sending requests constantly. They know it's scripts after all, so the time that it takes from clicking here to clicking there, you want to have a delay there. Sorry, Ivan, maybe you could just clarify what, what's the meaning of those min and max weight parameters? Okay, yeah, maybe it wasn't clear enough. So this means that for every user that Locos generates and uh, simulates, uh, it's going to take at least five seconds between one request and the next request that that user sends, and at most 15 seconds. So you're randomizing the interval? I randomize the interval, yeah. Any other questions? Hush. <laughs> I just want to make you run me up, thanks. No, uh, no, uh, thank you. It was, uh, <laughs> thanks for the talk. So, Essentially, this service has already been nicely kind of segmented, and then you're hitting the API. Rather, there's no kind of coupling between the front end layer. Kind of, you're purely hitting the API to make the users. It's, pure, the, it's the back end that we're testing. Yeah. And have you already kind of instrumented the API in a way that, like, so are you scraping the logs from it, or or, or does this inject logging? Because how do you make your charts, or is it the standard HTTP max response, five, you know, uh, um, 500 type stuff? Yeah, for the HTTP case, you can do, you can have the standard response times. Uh, in our case, we use a proprietary uh, protocol that we have in-house in Bloomberg. So we have also our, our login systems. We have a, a matrix uh, infrastructure that we use. And you specify in the, in case, in our case, for a custom client, you just specify here, like the, the request and the time. So we do it in, like, in, a, in a special way. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I used Locust a few years ago, and I found it quite hard to produce enough load to, to kind of hit the limit. What would your rough distribution be between the size of the, the load cluster and the size of your like actual machine? So, like rough number of cores comparison. Well, then, um, the the output cluster where we're running the load test is just two machines, which is downside. Uh, it's a representative of a production machine, but it's, there there are a lot more production machines. So. 
it's smaller than the production machine because we're assuming that it's proportional. So we do a proportional load as well from the, from the cloud. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't take that much to, to generate enough load. Um, I'm actually not sure. Uh, we definitely have more locust to slips. Uh, we just said the, the, the number of users that we need, and it, it managed to, to generate the load. Yeah. But very much that we are not using the full uh, uh, production like environment to, to test. We assume that it's proportional. So, um, how do you export? What how can you export, what are your options for exporting metrics from locusts? So if you're running your load testing, um, you're going to have some information coming out of that load testing, yeah. you know, the request. You get a CSV file, so you can get it downloaded from the, from the web interface. It actually, it's actually shown on the video, um, the very end. Oh, nah. No one ever see it. So you can get a CSV file with all the data that you see in, in the screen, and then you can process that yourself. No, it's purely raw data. We got any other questions in the room? So you said you were using uh, Bloomberg proprietary service. Uh, was there any challenges with that? Did Locust make any assumption that you must be hitting HTTP or you must be hitting something that it knows roughly what it's like? Um, we're using the libraries that we have in Python to access the, those services in, in with uh, protocol. So that was basically everything that we needed. Awesome. Thank you very much for some fantastic Thanks. questions. And thank you, Ivan. Uh, great talk.